Hey everyone, just want to give you a heads up before the audio for this episode starts up and you realize that's a bit off. It's been a while since I've done any recording with a microphone, so I didn't position it as optimally as I should have. So for the audio for this episode, I will sound further away from the microphone, and that's all on me, so I apologize for that. Hopefully it isn't too bad and you can still pick up on what I'm trying to say. So, sorry in advance, and I hope you still enjoy the episode. Eldath is the supreme pacifist of the Forgotten Realms. Abhorring violence of any kind, she implores her followers to only use violence as a last resort. The many pools, springs, and waterfalls dedicated to her serve as places of refuge, reflection, and healing for those in need. I am Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. Titles. Some of the titles El Death goes by are The Quiet One, Goddess of Singing Water, Mother Guardian of Groves, The Green Goddess, and The Mother of the Waters. Portfolio and Domains. El Death's portfolio includes waterfalls, springs, streams, pools, stillness, peace, and quiet places. For 5th edition, Eldath's suggested domains are life and nature. Appearances and Manifestations Eldath commonly appears and is depicted as a dark-haired human woman wearing a gown of shimmering green with eyes of deep green. Other depictions and sightings describe her as a dryad, nereid, or sea elf with blue and green in her hair. In all depictions, she goes barefoot. In other appearances, her hair is long, translucent, and colorless, said to be flowing like water. Eldath only tends to appear to her own worshippers or to the wounded who make their way knowingly or unknowingly into one of her sacred locations. As described in the second edition Face and Avatar supplement, to attack Eldath was to suffer from a significant penalty to your attack. Spellcasters would also need to succeed on a wisdom save in order to even cast a spell against her. She is capable of reducing any undivine undead to dust with a simple touch. Eldath chooses to forgo any damaging abilities and spells in favor of those that heal, charm, repel, or incapacitate any foe. Her smile is said to charm and befriend any beast. Eldath can levitate at will, and either through touch or by merely being within 10 feet of her, all matter is purified and all poisons are nullified. Her favorite weapon, if it can be called that, is a net. Eldath's most common manifestation is a whispering wind that may communicate a message and or revive any dead plants that the wind touches. Eldas's will might also manifest through a vast variety of different woodland creatures, dryads, sylphs, nereids, sprites, unicorns, many different wild and water flowers, and gemstones with a watery hue. Personal History There's not much to say on Eldas's history in the Forgotten Realms. Eldath is held to be a member of the First Circle. The first circle is a collection of nature deities who are thought to have formed the first druid circle in the Forgotten Realms. Shanti, Eldath, Maleki, Sylvanus, as well as Auril, Malar, Talos, and Umberly are considered to be the deities of the first circle. In 720 Del Reckoning, Eldath appeared alongside a host of other deities to support the founding of the Harpers at a moss-covered hill called the High Dale. When she was brought down to the surface of Faerun during the Time of Troubles, she spent most of her time alongside Maleki. Following the Time of Troubles, Eldath moved herself from the Prime Material Plane in 1369 Dale Reckoning to the Plane of Elysium, where she established her own realm known as the True Grove. Personality In 1st edition, Eldath was listed as a neutrally aligned deity. From 2nd edition onwards, Eldath has been a neutral good aligned deity. 
I don't know what caused the shift in alignment, whether it was simply a design change or not. The only real lore explanation available is Eldath moving herself from the material plane to the plane of Elysium. Eldath is a pacifist, unwilling to come to blows with anyone or any being even in the face of an open threat. To be around Eldath is to be put in a place of calm and stillness. She is said to be a guardian over druid groves, and it is claimed that she is present whenever calm exists between people. Those perceptive enough may be able to pick up on her song being sung by every waterfall and brook. Eldath is a mysterious deity who speaks little and is shy. By giving way to those who threaten her, she places her enemies into a false sense of victory, only to then use her influence to sway those on her enemy's side over time. Personal Realms We'll start with a description of her personal realm and the Great Wheel cosmology that is used in 1st edition, 2nd edition, and is now currently used in 5th edition. Beginning with 1st edition and continuing on into 2nd edition, Eldath resided on the Prime Material Plane alongside her fellow nature deity, Maliki. During 2nd edition, Eldath had moved to the Outer Plains and established her own personal realm called the True Grove. This realm is found on Aronia, the second layer of Elysium. It is said that this move coincided with her shift in alignment as a neutral deity to one that is neutral good. I was not able to find any real details about the true grove, but there are several different places where worshippers of Eldath can access this realm on Toral. Some of them include near the upper reaches of the Unicorn Run in the High Forest, in the Elven Court near Lake Stember, at Eldath's Water in the Misty Forest, deep in the Forest of Tethir, in the heart of the King's Forest in Cormir, atop Oak Hill in the Border Forest north of the River Tesh, and in several other unnamed forested areas. In general, Elysium is a plain of ease. The plain is patrolled by powerful celestials of neutral good called Gardenels. The layer of Aronia on Elysium is composed primarily of mountainous terrain. Here, the weather is far more unpredictable and less pleasant than it is on other layers of Elysium. Though it is not stated, the true grove is likely found in one of the many valleys where the vast majority of people live. In Aronia, the plain-spanning river, known as the Oceanus, is most rapid and wild. I can only imagine that there are several waterfalls spilling down from the rocky terrain into Eldath's realm. Now I will describe Eldath's realm and the Great Tree Cosmological Model used in 3rd edition. In the Great Tree Cosmological Model, Eldath resides on the plane of the House of Nature. Here Eldath resides alongside many of the other nature-based deities of the Forgotten Realms. The Gardenelles are the chief protectors of this plane, much like they are on Elysium. The inhabitants live in harmony with nature. Eventually over time, those souls begin to take on anthropomorphic features to the point that they become celestial animals. Boundaries of the individual realms for each deity is loose and peaceably overlap with those realms of other deities. Eldath's realm here is called the True Grove and is marked out by tall oaks and burbling springs. I was not able to find any details for Eldath's realm in the World Axis Cosmological Model that is used in 4th edition. Allies and Allegiances Eldath's superior is Sylvanus, and she operates under his influence alongside Maliki. Eldath sees Sylvanus as a paternal figure, though she is often not a fan of Sylvanus's tough demeanor. Instead, she gets along better with Maliki, whom she sees as a sister. She finds common cause with Lathander, Shanti, and Selune. Note, it has been documented that Tempest and Eldath have a unique perspective of one another. Eldath does not hate Tempest despite his portfolio over an advocation for war. At the same time, Tempest thinks Eldath is nothing but naive, but cannot help but respect Eldath's unwa unwavering pacifism. Enemies As to be expected, Eldath's chief enemies are those deities that advocate in favor of violence and pain. These include deities like Malar, Loviatar, Bane, and Talos. Deity and Avatar Stat Blocks The only stat block available for Eldath is a 2nd edition stat block for her avatar from the Faiths in Avatar supplement. Symbols 
Helgath's only known symbol is a waterfall plunging into a still pool, surrounded by green ferns on both sides upon a circular disc. Central Dogma This excerpt is from the Face and Pantheon supplement from 3rd edition. Peace can only come from within and cannot be taught or imposed. Seek stillness and thereby find peace. Plant trees and green leaf things and tend to such things when they need it, wherever they may be. Nurture and aid, and do not restrict or punish. Work violence only to defend, and slay no thing of the forest except to prevent it from slaying themselves or any other under their protection. Swear to take no thinking life except in direct need. Share with all beings the beneficial things that grow in or come from running water that all may know and praise Eldath. The inner peace Eldath wishes each person finds is said not to be something that can be learned from a book, but rather from meditation and inner insight. Presence of the Faith Many of Eldath's worshippers include druids, pacifists, monks, some mystics, and rangers. The typical alignment of her worshippers are neutral good, chaotic good, and chaotic neutral. Many who are worshippers and clergy of Eldath are vegetarians and or herbalists. Eldath is often forgotten by the population of Faerun in favor of her fellow allied nature deities. It is believed that this is because Eldath's pacifism in the face of conflict runs contrary to many people's sensibilities in a world full of monsters and other evil things. Many who are worshippers or clergy of Eldath were victims of such violence and evil in their past. Just as Myliki, Eldath, and Savannus work together, the clergy and worshippers of these three deities work often with one another. The Church of Eldath is one of the three main clerical bodies in the Emerald Enclave. At the top of the Enclave are the chosen of Myliki, Eldath, and Sylvanus. The Church of Eldath has also has ties with the Harpers as well. While it is common for druids in the same circle to worship one deity, like Eldath, it is not uncommon either to come across other druid circles that allow druids who worship different nature-based deities. Responsible and knowledgeable hunters and woodcutters make sure they have an open dialogue with any druid circles or priestly bodies devoted to nature deities in their area of work. They may face actions on the part of the Eldathian church, nonviolent unless the need arises, but actions nonetheless to subvert such greedy and careless practice. It is considered taboo to strike a clergy member of Eldath, and further misfortune is said to fall on those who murder any clergy members. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy The Church of Eldath is a small one. Some members settle in their own places of peace and quiet away from other clergy members. Here, common folks seek out a place of peace and tranquility, while some clergy members take to the road to teach and preach and tend to holy sites that they visit. The hierarchy is simple in construction. A collective of clerics report to their senior cleric, who in turn reports to a grand cleric. A grand cleric presides over a region of Faerun. Those clergy members who have served the church long enough or have completed great deeds are given the honorific of exalted. Many exalted are the heads of temple groves and are also given the title of keeper of the fastness. Responsibilities and duties of clergy and worshippers. The clergy and clerics of Eldath often help druids in establishing groves. Clergy and worshippers tend to the unspoiled places of nature. They will replant trees and other plants in burned down areas, cure diseases from plants and bodies of water, allow for the free flow of water, and irrigate forested areas all with natural means. Every clergy member of Eldath is taught how to swim. In turn, the clergy may offer lessons to locals in return for food or a small amount of coin. Some also receive coin after water dousing for settlements, camps, etc., in need of a well or other source of fresh water. Many of them are practiced herbalists capable of making potions and bombs. Others serve as mediators and diplomats to see that negotiations go as peacefully as possible. Pilgrimage is commonly practiced in the Eldathian church. Initiates tend need to travel to at least nine sacred groves to Eldath, after all, before they can settle down in a grove of their own. Many clergy and worshippers document the various forms of wildlife around them, and the numbers of such that may fluctuate over the years. 
These reports are then sent to the senior clergy members where they can discuss with other senior members from the Church of Sylvanus and Malecki the findings. From there, the three faiths decide which areas to serve their most attention. Orders and Priestly Bodies There is a group of pacifist orcs known as the Ondanti who are rather different from their kin culturally. They live in the southern area of the Tortured Lands. What state the Ondanti currently exist in is unknown. Prior to 1340 Dale Reckoning, the 15 tribes of Odonti lived in peace until the Zentarum enslaved 14 of these 15 tribes. The 15th tribe hid in seclusion and was said to be protected by the few clerics of Eldath amongst them and an ex- extra planar being sent by Eldath herself. It is theorized that the initial community was made up of orphaned orcs brought up by the clergy of Eldath in seclusion. The fact is, however, that the ancestors of the Odonti were raised behind the walls of Myth Ondath, a now ruined city once dedicated to peace. One group of organized clergy members go by the title of Stillwaters. They are unwavering pacifists in search of attaining a state of perfect peace. Their motives are constantly questioned in the face of violence and evil that exists in Faerun. None of them wear armor or weapons, and said they wear blue-green robes and gowns underneath light brown cloaks. Many of them wear crowns or garlands of wildflowers on their head. A circle of druids known as the Druids of Tall Trees are composed of worshippers of Eldath, Myliki, and Sylvanus. The circle resides in the northeastern region of the High Forest. Here they live amongst some of the tallest trees in Faerun, where they act as the caretakers of these trees. They also protect the ruins of the former elven kingdom of Erlan from those looking for power, wealth, and knowledge. A few rangers can be found in the ranks who can operate in a martial capacity should the need arise. Unique to Eldath's faith are the monks of the Disciples of the Yielding Way, also known as the Brothers and Sisters of the Open Palm. They both guard sacred sites of Eldath as well as seek out information for the clergy. They will only strike out in defense, never in offense. There exists a body of adventuring and wandering priests who call themselves Free Walkers. Along with the monks of the Yielding Way, the Free Walkers are skilled in combat, but they do their best to defeat their foes through defensive spells and techniques. The Free Walkers often lead people out from urban areas to places of worship, act as messengers between the various branches of the faith, and act as envoys to meet with other faiths. The Arbiters of the Quiet One is a group composed of some peace men and peace women. This group willingly goes into conflict areas to try and find peaceful ends to war and combat as they do their best to mediate between both sides. Appearance and Dress The clergy of Eldath favor clothes that are typically green and or blue in color. Some wear simple garments that are frayed and or well worn. Others wear green or blue robes decorated with various watercolor gemstones. Ceremonial robes tend to be composed of a series of sheer robes The sleeves are hemmed in such a way to imitate the ripples and waves of water. Rituals Clerics and druids of Eldath choose their spells once per day after a long period of meditation. Clergy members are to pray once when they wake up, at sunset, and at some time during the night. Now, none of you should feel beholden to this, but the source book I grabbed this last little bit of tidbit says that clergy members should do this unclad in clothing or as close to as that as possible. Do whatever you want. Don't let your DM or someone else at the table get all huffy if you playing your Eldath cleric or druid isn't praying in the nude. So the only calendar specific holy day for the faith is the greening, celebrated on the first day of spring, otherwise known in the realms as green grass. The church also holds festivals whenever the ice flow of winter begins to break, another sign of the beginning of spring. When a new holy place to Eldath is declared, the chant of fastness is performed. This divine chant is able to bless the water with healing magics for a few days. General locations of temples and shrines. Any springs, ponds, or pools blessed by Eldath herself or members of her clergy reportedly are capable of healing the sick, carrying madness, and lending comfort to those in palliative care. The sacred places of Eldath are open-air locations out in the wild where it is common to come across Eldathian clergy presiding over and tending to the sacred location. Temple groves dedicated to Eldath 
are known as fastnesses. It is also possible to find a clergy member just on the outskirts of a large settlement in cottages next to springs, ponds, or lakes. In many rural places, a pond or spring is dedicated to Eldath and known to be a place of quiet reflection. At dedicated ponds or springs, offerings can be left at the bottom of the water. In dedicated glades, people might leave their offerings in a stream or tie them to a bush or tree of prominence. These offerings are often broken weapons or items the faithful use to symbolize a past argument. Here they discard them as they make a prayer for peace in the future. Specific locations of temples and shrines. I'm going to need you all just to bear with me because this is actually the longest section of this podcast, believe it or not. We don't know a heck of a lot about Eldath, but there's a heck of a lot of locations related to her in the Forgotten Realms. One of the most revered places of Eldathian worship is the Duskwood Dell in the Snakewood Forest in Alm. Here, the river Rimril falls down Eldath's Mount in the Toril Mountain, in the Troll Mountain, sorry. The water gathers in a series of pools known as the Steps. The waterfalls here are known as the Green Goddess Falls. Here, senior clergy members train initiates before they are let out into the open world. Another named holy site at Eldath is the El Azad. Here resides the House of the Moon, a circular temple made of desert rock set in the middle of lake. The House of the Moon is surrounded by a sacred grove which holds well over a hundred springs within it. The Cave of Brother Lumen is a holy site where a disciple and monk of the Yielding Way dwelt in atonement for being openly violent in an altercation during the 12th century Dale Reckoning. Here he was provided a vision from Eldath, which instructed him to help the Paladin of Tyr back on the rightful path. From that day onwards, Brother Lumen served as a counselor to many individuals of different faiths. The cave and pool outside of the cave are said to have healing properties. The cave can be found by the Snowflake Mountains between Om and Tethir. The Wyvern Stones of Halak can be found in the western reaches of the Halak Forest. The Wyvern Stones are standing stones 12 feet in height that encircle a spring-fed pool of clear water. The Wyvern Stones once were the meeting place of the Wyvern Circle, a druidic circle primarily composed of worshippers of Eldath. Their druidic markings can still be found beneath the lichen and moss that now grows on the Wyvern Stones. The carved depictions of Wyverns remain clear to the observer, however. At last recording, the Wyvern Stones have been taken over by a druidic circle of evil lycanthropes devoted to Malar, known as the Blood Moon Circle, in 1363 Dale Reckoning. The Wyvern Stones in actuality act as pillars to support an ancient elven crypt in a grotto beneath the pool. This crypt is known as the Elfhold and is the burial crypt for House Armorathar, an elven noble house. Here in these crypts, Halak, a former archdruid to Eldath, is interred. Those who come in peace to the Elfhold may speak with Halak's ghost so long as they only seek lore and nothing else. The druidic ruins hidden beneath the moss and lichen hold keys to powerful divine spells that are no longer known. Druids of the Wyvern Circle merge some of their soul with the Wyvern Stones. If one was able to get in touch with these bound souls, the ancient druids might reveal keys to unlocking these old ruins and spells. What's more is that the pool here holds three active portals and one, malfe- mal- one malfunctioning portal. The portals can be accessed only by those of good alignment bearing a symbol of Eldath and after they shape change into the form of a fish. The portals lead to the Dustwalk Dells, Elizad, and the city of Ustan beneath the waters of the Sea of Fallen Stars. It is rumored that the malfunctioning portal leads to the edge of the Great Sea. The High Forest is said to be under the protection of Eldath and Myliki. It is an old tale that some nature-based deities visit their unicorn run in the form of a unicorn. Thus it is advised to do no harm to nature while one is near the banks of the unicorn run. Elven Tree at the edge of Cormanthor is a haven for the forces of good. Here clergy members of Sylvanus, Eldath, and Myliki help to protect those who come who call it home. Long ago, Myth on Death existed in the tortured lands. It was a city initially called Urensil. Then a millennia later, it was called Ondathel. The city was formed by pacifists from differing cultures and refugees in negative 8,210 Dale Reckoning. For millennia, this city served as a place of refuge and peace. 
The city was dedicated to Eldath, and the clergy and wizards acting together put up a mythal to protect the city from any further possible troubles in 555 Dale Reckoning. An evil lich priestess devoted to Oral, simply known as the Ice Queen, deplored myth on death. The Ice Queen and her forces failed to penetrate the mythal, and she sought out the power necessary to bring down this mythal. Utilizing an artifact known as the Gatekeeper Crystal, she and her second-in-command were able to siege the city for 11 long months. The crystal was split into three pieces and brought into various places in Myth on Death. The Ice Queen then activated the pieces, resulting in the complete and utter destruction of the Ice Queen's forces, the Mythal, and the city of Myth on Death. The dancing place in the Highdale is of great importance to the Harpers and for those of the Eldathian worshippers, who make a pil- pilgrimage there to the Holy Valley to offer their worship. Eldath has a significant following in the Vast, Termish, Cespic, the Great Dale, and the Horde Lands. The Silent Hall is a temple to Eldath and Eriabor. Shrines to Eldath can be found in Arkendale, Tasseldale, Kurth, the Misty Forest, and the Reaching Wood. Character Options For character options from 2nd edition, in the Face and Avatar supplement, you can find the breakdown for the Peace Man and the Peace Woman Specialty Priest class dedicated to Eldath. In Warriors and Priests of the Realm supplement, you can find the Stillwater option for the Priest class. For 3rd edition, in the Player's Guide to Faerun supplement, you can access the Initiative of Nature feat if you're a Cleric or Druid who is a patron of Eldath, Myliki, or Sylvanas. Continuing the trend of building backgrounds for worshippers in 5th edition, here are my suggested characteristics for an Eldathine worshipper background. For two skill proficiencies, I would take either two of medicine, nature, or persuasion. Uh, for your languages and tool proficiencies, I would suggest taking the herbalism kit and either Elvish or Sylvan as a chosen language. For the equipment, I would take the hermit's equipment lacking the five gold pieces that come with it to have access to a holy symbol of Eldath. And for your ribbon feature, I would take either the the Discovery feature from the Hermit or the Shelter of the Faithful feature from the Acolyte. Now here is just a list of the subclasses that I think would be thematically appropriate for NPC or PC to take in 5th edition. For the Cleric, you have the Light Domain and Nature Domain from the Player's Handbook. For a druid, you have the circle of the land, and I would choose to be a druid either trained on the coast or the forest for the circle of the land circle, and then also the circle of the moon from the player's handbook, and the circle of the shepherd subclass from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the monk, you have the way of the open hand or way of the four elements, who have a focus on water from the player's handbook. For those who might want to play as a disciple of the yielding way, for the paladin, I would take a look at the oath of the ancients from the player's handbook or the Oath of Redemption subclass from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. If someone wanted to play Free Walk, for example, for Rangers, you have the Hunter and Beastmaster, both from the Player's Handbook. For the Rogue, you have the Scout from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. For the Sorcerer, you have the Divine Soul Sorcerer from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. For the Warlock, you have the you have the Celestial Patron subclass from Xanthar's Guide to Everything, who might have a patron who is a Unicorn or a Gardenal. And finally, you will have the wizard for who might take the School of Divination subclass from the Player's Handbook for someone who might want to play as a mystic in service to Eldath. Dungeon Master Options The following is just a list of 5th edition monsters that might be associated with Eldath that you can find in 5th edition sources. Uh, so in the Monster Manual, you have the Dryad, the Sprite, the Unicorn, and a whole collection of beasts in the back of the monster manual that you can make use of. Uh, in the Mordekainen's Tome of Foes, you have the Eidolon paired with the Sacred Statue. In the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, I would reflavor the Conclave Druid, and I would reflavor the Trostani stat blocks. There aren't any stat blocks for the various Cardinals in any 5th edition sources currently. But if you have access to the Monster Manual 1 from 3.5 edition, Montrous Compendium Planescape Appendix 2, or Monster Manual 2 from 3rd edition, you can find stat blocks for Gardinals in there. If a Dungeon Master is looking for stat blocks that might be relevant to NPCs in their campaign, 
I would take a look at the following in 5th edition sources. In the Monster Manual, you have the Acolyte, Druid, Priest, and Scout style block. In Volo's Guide to Monsters, you have the Archbruid, Archbruid, Archdruid, Archer, and Martial Arts Adept stat block. Uh, in Mordekind's Tome of the Foes, you have the Tortle and Tortle Druid stat blocks. In the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, there's the Horncaller stat block. In the Tomb of Annihilation, you have a Tax Tabaxi Hunter stat block. Finally, in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, I would reflavor the stat block for the named NPC Halam, who is a monk uh, and cleric mix. So next, I'll talk about magic items that uh, DMs might be want to be aware of. Uh, Aldas' favorite weapon is the net. Um, in fifth edition, I haven't seen any magical type of net as yet listed anywhere. I might be mistaken, so please point me in that direction if I have misspoken. Uh, so Eldath's favorite weapon is a net, just like I said previously, but she doesn't have a named net that she has in her possession. The Chrystrum of Tranquility is a colorless crystal sphere about a foot in diameter, and it is an Eldathian artifact. Within the Chrystrum is the text of spells favored by the Church of Eldath. However, only clergy members of the Eldath can access these spells through specific means. By immersing the sphere in the natural waters of a pool, spraying, etc., or water contained in a non metallic bow bowl, the text within becomes accessible. A roster of spells is listed upon the surface of the sphere when properly accessed. By touching the name of one of the spells, the spell's description and effects become listed on the surface. In a sense, it's kind of like a tablet. The person holding the sphere can will the writing to transfer over to the surface of water to make it more readable. The Chrystrum can purify food and water simply by touching it to such things. It glows with fairy fire if its keeper wills it, and it contains 30 spells within its roster. It cannot be shattered by dropping it, cannot be altered, or allow itself to be cloaked by an illusion spell. It also levitates when it is thrown or accidentally dropped. If someone who is not of the faith touches the sphere, any writing made visible beforehand will vanish and become inaccessible. The Chrystrum is a venerated object and is to be protected by all means necessary by the faith. The Chrystrum is believed to have been crafted by Eldath herself not too long after the fall of Myth Draenor in 714 Dale Reckoning. Like many artifacts, the Chrystrum passed through many hands. It was last reported to have been in the hands of a half-elf named Elphira Alonthar, a chosen of Eldath in 1336 Dale Reckoning. As she fled enemies, Elphira made her way to the woods of Turlang, but no further knowledge of Elphira is known. That was until a vision from Eldath was sent to one of her clergy members and told that Elphira still lives, and if someone is to ever bring the Christ from to the House of the Moon, they will be granted with a reward. So far, no adventurer has been able to find the Christ from in the, world, in the woods of Terlang. If you're a DM, I would definitely consider making holy water available to your adventurers if they're to the stop in and visit a temple or house of worship dedicated to Eldath. In the Magic of Faerun supplement for 3rd edition, you can find the breakdown for the Staff of Peace and the Crystal Sphere of Singing Waters. The Staff of Peace is a simple magic item that grants a bonus to the wielder if they are a worshipper of Eldath. The Crystal Sphere of Singing Waters was inspired by the Chrystrum of Tranquility and its design. By pouring holy water over it, the sphere becomes activated for 24 hours. When activated, it glows with fairy fire, can purify food and drink as often as desired, and once per day it can cast neutralized poison and scrying. Now to round out this section, I just want to talk about various uh, magic items available in 5th edition sources that a DM might want to make use of. So from the Dungeon Master's Guide, I would take a look at the Amulet of Health, the Animated Shield, Razor's Defense, Brooch of Shielding, Candle of Invocation, Cap of Water Breathing, Cloak of Displacement, Cloak of Protection, Cloak of the Manta Ray, Decanter of Endless Water, Elven Chain, Eyes of the Eagle, Figurines of Wondrous Power, Folding Boat, Clothes of Swimming and Climbing, Hyangtum's Ointment, Mantle of Spell Resistance, Mariner's Armor, Necklace of Adaptation, Necklace of Prayer Beads, Periapt of Health, Periapt of Proof Against Poison, Periapt of Wound Closure, Potion of Animal Friendship, Potion of Resistance, Potion of Vitality, Potion of Water Breathing, Claw's Feather Tokens, Ring of Animal Influence, 
Ring of Invasion, Ring of Protection, Ring of Regeneration, Ring of Resistance, Ring of Swimming, Ring of Water Walking, Rod of Resurrection, Scroll of Protection, Spellguard Shield, Staff of Charming, Staff of Healing, Staff of the Woodlands, and the Tome of Understanding. And then from Xanthar's Guide for Everything, where you can find a listing of common rarity magic items, I would take a look at the Beat of Nourishment, the Horn of Silent Alarm, the Staff of Bird Calls, and the Staff of Flowers. Alright, thank you for listening to Religion in the Realms. If you're interested in keeping up with the release of future episodes, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are also uploaded to YouTube as well. The podcast's YouTube channel can be found under Religion in the Realms. If you wish to get in touch with me, my personal Twitter is at Shiv's Embrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com, all in lowercase. For those interested, I have posted a link in the video description to a Discord server I have set up. For audio listeners, you can find the link to the, pro- uh, to the infight pinned on the podcast Twitter page. Next episode will be on Torm, Deity of Duty, Loyalty, and Obedience. Until next time, may Tormoria look kindly upon your dice rolls, Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path. Music for this episode, Truth in the Stones, by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0.